Welcome to Ivy Church. Welcome to Ivy Church. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Good to see you. Welcome to Ivy Church. Welcome to Ivy Church. Thank you for being here. It is great to have you with us. Uh, if you're new to Ivy, you can find out more about us on our website, ivychurch.org. There you can sign up for our newsletter as well, find out what's going on, and you can get in touch by, by email and hi at ivychurch.org. Uh, my, name, my name is Steve, uh, and today we're in our series in Colossians about how to live a transformed life, or maybe a transforming life. Those of us who follow Jesus aren't saying we are the finished transformed article, but someone who was lost but is now found and forgiven. Someone who stumbles and needs Jesus to guide us. We acknowledge our weaknesses and the need for Jesus' strength to keep going. That we fail and need God to clean up our mess through his grace and his mercy. We were trapped in the mess of our sin, but somehow through Jesus' death and resurrection, we have received new life and freedom. So today uh, we are in Colossians in chapter 2 and we are looking at how we can be all about Jesus without religion getting in the way. Uh, We're going to worship together in a moment but first let's pray. Father thank you for this day and for time now to worship you together. We want to be all about you, we want to be continually transformed by you. Thank you for fulfilling the law through Jesus' death and resurrection so that we can know you and have a relationship with you. And we're sorry uh, for the times this week we have let you down and others and ourselves. Thank you for your love and your forgiveness. We want to worship you together now. Amen. Give you everything. Your goodness is. 
from Sarah uh, and you may uh, be able to find some questions in the description for you to discuss or think about um, but let's let's hear from Sarah now what do you see when you look in the mirror are you satisfied with what you see are you happy? You're doing a great job in life. You're looking good for your age and stage. Or is the mirror a painful place? A reminder of where we aren't or what we lack or perhaps what has gone before. One of the things that I have really enjoyed when our kids were very little was how much they loved looking at themselves in the mirror. They would spend hours doing a little dance, giving themselves a kiss and just loving that little person reflected back at them. So what changes? Where and when do dissatisfaction and uncertainty creep in? Because I'm sure I'm not the only one who can recognise that when I look and spend time in self-reflection. Obviously we grow up, we're not children our whole lives and we realise that the world isn't such a great place, we make mistakes, we realise that we're capable of all sorts of things that we could never have imagined at a young age. Hurts and hang-ups come and plague each and every one of us. But as followers of Jesus, we are promised something completely incredible, completely amazing. And we read about it in a verse that you may know well. It's John chapter 10, verse 10. And it says this, The thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life to the full. A full life. A full life. What does that even look like today? What does it look like for you? Does it mean a, a full social media feed, a full plethora of friends, a full bank account perhaps? Does it mean a life of fulfilled ambitions, a bank full of money, uh, weekends full of activities? Maybe that's a very Western-centric viewpoint. Maybe living a full life is something that only some of us can achieve and many people just want to live. Maybe it's about just having enough to eat, just having parents who can love us and bring us up, just having the ability to get to school, to get to jobs and to get ourselves out of poverty. Maybe it's about living in a nation where we're not subject to war or corruption or control. There are plenty of descriptions of what a full life, or even a livable life, to be honest, is. But I'm not sure that's what John's talking about in the Gospel. And I'm not sure that's what we're talking about in this series, about living a transformed life. See, Paul is telling us that we only can find full transformation, fullness of life, in Jesus. 
Our lives can be and are being and will be transformed through him. But there is resistance to this. So if we're not experiencing fullness of life right now, and let's be honest, I know my experience often falls far short of this, then let's spend some time digging into the word together and see what needs to change and what we can do to sort it out. Last week, Anthony kicked off a new series about how to live a transformed life. And we're looking at the book of Colossians. It's an amazing little book. It's only four chapters. In fact, if you did what he said last week, you'll have already read it at least once, if not twice, because he's encouraged us to be reading a chapter of this every day. I started reading some commentaries about Colossians. I thought it's a short book, so there'll only be short commentaries. How wrong I was. There are pages and pages and pages written on this tiny book because there is such depth, there is such treasure, there is such richness in these writings of Paul. And I would so encourage you to spend time in it, to read it and to meditate on it. I've only got time today to pull out a couple of nuggets for us. But if you've got time in the week with your grow groups, then read it, read it and pray it and take it line by line and see what God is saying to you about how how you can live a full and a transformed life. In verses two to three, Paul says this, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Here's that word again, full And who doesn't want to live a life of being encouraged in heart and united with others in love and having the full riches of complete understanding? What Paul's talking about here is so attractive and it's possible. This is what is on offer for us. Paul wants us to have confidence in the faith that we have. If you think back to John 10, 10, the enemy wants to reverse this. He wants to undo and undermine this confidence. He wants us not to be encouraged, but to be discouraged. He wants us not to be united in love, but disunited and fighting and at war with each other. He doesn't want us to be in the light, having fullness of knowledge, but he wants us to be confused and harassed and stressed and unsure. Have you ever tried to walk somewhere in the dark? I quite frequently try and take a trip to the loo or try and get a glass of water in the middle of the night without waking anyone up. And we have some creaky floorboards. And I have a little route that I do to avoid the creaky floorboards. But there have been times in the night when someone's left a car or someone's put a pile of stuff and I have tripped over something that I didn't expect to find there in the night. And it takes every little bit of willpower not to scream or shout or say something I shouldn't say when I when I have happen upon this painful object in the dark. Paul, God, Jesus, they don't want us to be in the dark. We are people of the light. And in this book of Colossians, and particularly in chapter two, Paul is shedding a heap of light uh, on some of the situations that the church in Colossae were living through. Remember this verse from Matthew 4. We say it a lot around Christmas. He quotes, Jesus is quoting Isaiah and he says, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. We're people of the light, not to be content with darkness, with lies, with shadows, with fake news, with uncertainty. This is great news in a confusing society. There's a true God out there and we can truly know him. So what are the two things that I want to talk about this morning? Well, number one, I am brought to fullness in Christ. Let's read from Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 to 13. It's a big chunk of scripture. I'm going to be reading from the NIV initially. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. 
For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The first pitfall that the Colossians could fall into is trying to add Jesus into an existing set of worldviews, trying to have less of Jesus than Jesus is, trying to reduce him, trying to dilute him, trying to hang on to our old um, ways of doing things, our old ideas, our old identities, our old loyalties. You see, they lived in a world of pluralism. There were many gods. There were many identities. There were many things that were important to them. They had many idols. And by that, I don't mean like carved statues, but I just mean things that were important. And though we don't live in that time, surely the same can be said of us. There are many things that are important to us. There are many loyalties that we have. There are many values that we subscribe to, perhaps even unconsciously, that when Christ comes to live in our hearts, need to be put to death, need to take second place. We cannot have Sunday religion. We cannot have Jesus as a nice add-on. Jesus is not a, 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 an addition or a kind of a, a way of, of making our lives better. Jesus doesn't require just a little bit of us. He wants all of us and he wants us to submit all to him. Paul talks about hollow and deceptive philosophies depending on human traditions or elemental spiritual forces. These are the values, these are the systems, these are the ideas that we Um, give priority to in our lives that we strive after for some of us that's wealth for some of us that's status for some of us that's survival for some of that there's a sense of national pride that we can find to be extremely important for some of us there's a sense of our social class that is super important to us All of these things need to submit to Christ. All of these things need to die in our lives so that we can be fully alive in him. There is no room for any other authority in our lives when we follow Jesus. He is Lord and if he is Lord, then we put him first. I love the way that the message version of the Bible, the the paraphrase, puts a few of these verses. And I'm just going to read verses 6 to 10 because I just think it's brilliant. It says this, My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ, Christ Jesus, the Master. Now live him. You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it and let your living spill over into thanksgiving. And watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in him so you can see him clearly. You don't need a telescope, a microscope or a horoscope to realise the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. When you come to him, that fullness comes together for you too. His power extends over everything. 
I love what he said. Stop studying. Stop learning. We have got a, a faith that is rooted in Christ. It talks about and we sing about Christ as our firm foundation, the rock upon which we stand. Let's stop looking at the rock and trying to break it down into pieces. And let's stand on it. Let's live on it. Let's live out of it. There's no value to be found in arguments There's no value to be found in novelty, in mystery, in conspiracy, when Christ can be seen and heard clearly. And if that's not clear enough, Paul goes on to remind us what Jesus did for us. Just two weeks ago, we celebrated Easter, didn't we? Two weeks ago, uh, we were reminded of what Christ did on the cross. And Paul spells it out for us. He cancelled the charges, the debts against us, and he disarmed the powers and authorities and triumphed over them on the cross. What he did on the cross, no one else can do. No one else has ever been able to do. No nation state, no God, no idol, no value system can ever do what God has done because he has the ultimate power and the authority. And our lives in him are fully transformed. We're no longer ruled by our flesh, by our desires, our ambitions. But these things are put to death and we are now full of faith. So, we can be full in Christ, point one. Point two, we can be free in Christ. And again, I'm going to read us a good chunk of scripture here. We're going to read verses 16 to 23. I wanted to cut it down, but to be honest, there's so much good stuff, I'm not going to deny you it. It is worth living, uh, reading this stuff out because it's brilliant. Therefore, verse 16, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. As we've already seen in the last passage, Christ bought our freedom on the cross So in this case, Paul is warning us not to go backwards, not to go back into slavery, not to pick up additional burdens that Jesus has taken away and that Jesus has set us free from. Paul was writing to a group of people who had come to Christ, but were still looking at the Jewish religion of the day for some of their validation. Some Christians had been told that they needed to physically get circumcised in order to really be Christians. Others were told that they had to abide by certain laws and rights. They had to observe certain practices in order to be a Christian. What was going on here was that people were adding things on top of Christ. They were looking at practice and they were looking at performance in order to give value to people's faith. Today, for us, it might look like adding a whole heap of religious to-dos into faith, onto faith in Jesus. Things that ultimately put a heavy burden on believers and squash the fullness of life right out of them. Jesus did everything that was necessary for us to live full and free. There's nothing more that we need to do to earn or deserve our salvation. The whole point is that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. He didn't die for us when we were doing a little bit better, when we'd got a few things sorted out. He didn't wait for us to make any form of positive life change. He did everything that was necessary while we were in our worst possible state. Please don't hear me wrong here. There is lots of value in religious discipline. 
there is much to be said for going to church on a Sunday, for being part of a grow group, for having daily quiet time, for fasting, for taking time out to go on retreat, all sorts of wonderful things that we can do. But only in as much as it is focused on connecting with Jesus and not a measure of our performance or a way that we could add something into our faith or get closer to Jesus or earn something which is not rightfully ours. Your faith isn't a performance for other people to judge. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's not about what you do or don't do primarily. It's about who you know. Once you get that right, then what you do is actually motivated out of love for God. It's not motivated about out of should do or have to do or need to do. It's motivated by long to do, love to do, can do nothing but uh, be closer to him. This passage points out some things that we often fall into. False humility or getting puffed up, thinking too little of ourselves or thinking too much of ourselves. The whole point is the problem comes when we're thinking of ourselves. When we put ourselves on the throne and we knock Christ off. When we want to perform, when we want to achieve, when we want to justify ourselves rather than accept what Jesus has done for us. Paul refers to this life as a shadow life. He says all of these things that we do are just a shadow and Jesus is the substance. He is the fullness. He is the light. And when the light is switched on, the shadows have to flee. So to bring this into land, how do we live a transformed life? How can we really see ourselves full in Christ and free in Christ? I think the key actually comes in verse 19, and I'm going to revisit that for us just now. It says this, They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. This picture of the body is so helpful because our bodies do. They grow and they change and they develop. And as Christians, we're talking about a life that is transformed and transforming. There is growth. There is development. There is maturity. All of this is available to us. How? By staying connected to the head. Those people who had got puffed up, those people who were measuring their performance, those people who said you, Christ isn't enough and you have to add all this extra stuff on top, they'd lost connection with the head. They'd got trapped into religion. They'd got trapped by tradition. They'd got trapped into superstition. They'd, got, they'd settled for something that was less than what they had been promised. And the good news is that we if we are connected to the head, can fully expect to live a life where we are transformed. But the enemy doesn't like it. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. He comes to destroy. That's what we already talked about, didn't we? He comes to undermine our confidence in Christ. So perhaps today you can recognize that in your own life. Perhaps you can see that you're feeling discouraged. You're feeling disunited. You're not in close relationship with others or with Christ. You're feeling in the dark. Then we're going to pray for you to be reconnected to the head. Perhaps today a light has just come on in your head and you have realized that you don't need to be confused any longer. You don't need to be seeking after truth here, there and everywhere when the source of truth and life is found in the person of Jesus. And that if you connect to him, if you accept what he did for you on the cross, you can be free and completely transformed and transforming until the day that you meet him. So, I'm going to pray for us for you to reconnect or connect for the first time so that you can live a full life and a free life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your words. I thank you for the encouragement that Paul gives us. I thank you for the truth that we can stand on, that you are the one God. And if we are connected to you, if we honour you as Lord, and as we, if we put you as first in our lives, we can fully expect to know truth, to know love, to know encouragement, and to know the light that only you can bring. So Lord, we seek that this morning. We want to be connected to you. We want to acknowledge you as our Lord and our Saviour. Be with us today. Help us transform us more and more into your likeness.
In your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we've got lots going on throughout the week here. Uh, so make sure you do check the website and find out what's going on and social media. Uh, and I hope you have a great week. See you soon. Mm -hmm.